I will open up the hearing on ACR 19th uh, in our, on affirming states' powers based on the Constitution for the United States and the Constitution of New Hampshire. And the chair calls on uh, the sponsor, Representative Dan Itzah. Welcome to the committee, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Representative Dan Itzah. I represent Rockingham County District 9. Um, what I'm passing out to you is uh, the draft of the Kentucky resolutions. Um, I first entered this type of legislation approximately two years ago. Uh, it was then HCR 6. And at that time, it was basically a cut and paste from the Kentucky resolutions. The Kentucky resolutions were written by Thomas Jefferson, and then his good friend James Madison took them and introduced them in Virginia, and they were they are known as the Virginia resolutions. As uh, the title suggests, uh, this resolution is derived. Uh, are the, the principles behind this resolution are derived <coughs> entirely from the Constitution of New Hampshire and the Constitution of the United States. Um, the first thing I would like to point out to you, uh, New Hampshire Constitution Part 1, Article 7, really sets the framework and, re and realize that this, uh, this Constitution first predated the Constitution of the United States by uh, three years. It was originally adopted in, 1980, in 1784. Then New Hampshire ratified the Constitution for the United States, uh, putting it into force because they were the ninth state in 1789. And then because of a large number of changes in 1792, New Hampshire re-enrolled, ratified and re-enrolled uh, our Constitution. Part 1, Article 7, was unchanged uh, from 1784. But it's important to realize it was ratified both before and after the Constitution of the United States. The people of this state have the sole and exclusive right of governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, and do it forever after, and do it forever after, shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right pertaining thereto, which is not, or may not hereafter be by them, expressly delegated to the United States of America in, con in Congress assembled. That is the basic premise of the Constitution of the United States, in that it has only the power delegated to it by the people of the states. Uh, if I was going, I'm going to point out uh, some fundamental principles out of the Kentucky Resolutions upon which this resolution is derived. Now, one of the things I did between HCR 6 and this resolution is that where before I really just cut and paste out of the Kentucky Resolutions, I really reformatted it this time to be more um, conducive to the modern mind. That instead of great long sentences and everything, all the principles stated up front, and then at the end, uh, some conclusions drawn. Uh, I instead attempted to make it more, if you will, staccato. Uh, a couple of, of uh, principles, and then a conclusion stated. A couple of principles and conclusion stated. So that it's much easier to draw the connection between the various fundamental principles and the conclusions. If you look at uh, the first resolution, the Kentucky Resolution, and you get down, um, oh, about eight sentences down, it says that the government created by this compact, that's the Constitution for the United States, was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the, the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its powers. It's a very fundamental concept. The government of the United States does not get to be the final judge of what the Constitution means. Because then they can say it means whatever they want it to. Well, if, they're, if they can't be the final or exclusive judge of the Constitution, and there must be one, who is? 
But it, but as in every case, other case, among a com a compact among powers having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself. So it's the states, or the people of the states, that have the power to judge what the meaning of the Constitution is and what the delegated powers are. That is the premise upon which the sovereignty resolution is based. The next thing I would like to call your attention to is Article 7 of the resolutions. This is very, very important because it is this construction, the, or the, the evil uh, presented in the seventh article of the Kentucky Resolution that is the foundation for pretty much every overreach of the federal government. And this is not the first time that this misconstruction was addressed. James Madison addressed it, I believe, in Federalist Paper 43, but it might be 45. And I can get that for you later. I didn't want to take the time to try and print it out before my testimony here. But I wouldn't have had time. I'll get it to you after I'm, I'll go print it out and get it back to you afterward. That the construction of line, oh, let me back up for a moment. The, the setting for the original discussion of this in, fe, in the Federalist Papers the anti-federalists were saying that the construction that the Congress has the power to make all laws, ne all laws necessary to uh, carry out the foregoing powers meant they could do anything they wanted. And Madison pointed out to them in the Federalist Papers that this was a, a blatant misrepresentation because the anti-federalists were advocating staying under the... Uh, uh, Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation had the same construction. That the, cons the construction applied by the general government, as is evidenced by the sundry of their proceedings, that to those parts of the Constitution of the United States which delegate to Congress the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imports, and excises, to pay debts, and to provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States, and then at the end, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the powers vested in the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. To connect those two, the, the very beginning and the very end, goes to the destruction of all limits described to their power by the Constitution. And what Madison explained in the Federalist Papers, where he goes into much greater detail, is that the common construction of English, that, for, that introductory leg to collect taxes and provide for the common defense and general welfare up front, the common practice in English is to make a general statement and then to lay out particulars. This is what you're going to do, and these are the powers you have to do it. And to take the statement at the end that you have the power to make the laws necessary to carry out all those specific duties allows you to do anything you want to, destroys the remainder of the document. He says anybody who would, who would tell you that you can read it that way has only two options, and I'm paraphrasing Madison, is that either you don't know how to read English or you're lying. It's, very, it's that simple. You're either illiterate or a liar. Because the com common practice is to make the general statement and then to lay out the particulars. And it's also important to realize that because this statement was made in the Federalist Papers, which were the, the back and forth between the two conflicting opinions on whether or not to adopt the Constitution, that the adoption of the Constitution was made with the knowledge that this was in fact the case. That the limitation set out in Article I, Section 8, limited the powers of the federal government to those enumerated powers. So every state that ratified it, ratified it with that understanding. 
because the man who wrote the document said, that's the way it must be read. We go to the middle. I'm just kind of pointed out to you because it's hard to describe. We're in Article 8, and we're kind of there. You can see I bracketed it. And this is, this is, again, just a general statement, but it sets out the whole credo of nullification. That it does also believe that to take from the states all the powers of self-government and to transfer them to a general and consolidated government without regard to the special delegations and reservations solemnly agreed to in that compact that we just discussed, it is, is not for the peace and happiness or for prosperity of these states. And that therefore this commonwealth is determined, as it doubts not its co-states are, to submit to undelegated and, uncon and consequently unlimited powers in no man or body of men on earth. That in case of an abuse of the delegated powers, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy. But where the powers are assumed, which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy, and that every state has a natural right, in cases not within the compact, to nullify of their own authority all assumption of powers by others within their limits. That without this right, they would be under the dominion, absolute and unlimited, of whosoever might exercise this right of judgment for them. That nevertheless, this commonwealth, that's uh, Kentucky, from motives of regard and respect to it for its co-states, has wishes to communicate with them on the subject. If a power is not delegated to the general government, and they make a law in regard to that power, we'll say the states gave the power to control commerce between the states, so that the states could not institute duties and uh, uh, duties and imposts upon each other's, you know, what's coming into their own state from the other states. That was the purpose. That when the federal government presumes to control how we grow our vegetables through, let's say, a uh, Food and Safety Act, that they are, that we have the right to say within our borders, that act is not valid. We make no mention of what happens in the other states. That's for them to determine if they want to submit to that undelegated power. But we have the absolute and natural right to say that a power not delegated to the federal government cannot be exercised within our power, within our borders. That was position of Madison, that was position of Jefferson, and that was the understanding of the Constitution for the United States when it was ratified by this state. I'd be happy to field any questions. Okay, thank you, Representative. Do we have any questions for uh, Representative? Yeah. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman. So thank you, Representative. Uh, you know, whenever you do a presentation, I learn more and more about our history, and I greatly appreciate that. Just a couple of questions, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> What is the rationale for bringing, for introducing this resolution? It is to, uh, well, for one, to educate ourselves about our rightful powers, but also to put the federal government on notice they are, that we are not going to uh, blindly submit to whatever they dictate. That we are going to make a we are going to make a critical evaluation of what they are attempting to impose and to determine if they have the power to impose it. Um, the impact moving forward with this resolution, how do you see that unraveling? Um, unraveling is an it. Well, <laughs> it, it's it is just I know, okay. I played out. I, I, I just, it's just the view. Uh, I would hope that it will encourage the other states to take similar actions and it will inspire the federal government to be more circumspect in what they do. And I want to make one other important change, uh, notice of one other important change. Last time I introduced this, 
I made the statement of our felicity to our sister states up at the front of the resolution. And at the back, I made some rather strident uh, statements. And it was therefore interpreted by many, as much as I tried to correct that interpretation, as a, a, a resolution of secession, that which was never the case. Therefore, I took care, in this case, uh, to soften the stridency of my statements and to put the statement of felicity to our sister states at the end. So this is the last thing that people read, so that they remember that this is not an attempt to dissolve the Union, but to restore the Union. And so you're alluding to page 4, line 13? Uh, well, uh, next yeah, 13 onward, really. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah, that's so, okay. Right, so that, so that, remember guys, this isn't to destroy, yeah. Yeah. this is to build. Okay, thank you for Any other questions? Uh, Representative Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Uh, is this the, the bill, HCR 6, that, uh, when do you spot and then Um, that was the original one, yes. And this is a better statement. For what? There were other states that called you about this because they wanted to draft uh, There were many, several, I mean, uh, Louisiana, uh, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, among others, uh, Texas, I think, too. Uh, uh, North Carolina, matter of fact, the day after our legislature rejected HCR 6, the North Carolina legislature passed it. Well, what? <coughs> Um, in various forms, additions and subtractions, there, I know that at one point there were about 35, 38 uh, such resolutions pending. I, mean, I can't, cannot give you a count of how many facts. But many of them after this appeared in, last, uh, in February of 2009 adopted our language. Are there any other questions? Uh, Representative Christensen. Um, throughout the uh, whole topic, you may mention the United States. Okay. And what I am looking for is the difference between the United States and the United States of America. And what's, this controls the United States, which is the federal government, which is Washington, D.C., um, overreaching the authority of the Fed against the sovereign states that make up the republic, which New Hampshire funds. So myself, I'm not a citizen of the United States, I'm a sovereign citizen of New Hampshire, one of the states making up the United States of America. Do you agree with my logic on that? Um, in part. Uh, you'll notice in the Constitution for the United States that it interchangeably uses uh, United States and United States of America. Both phrases appear in that document. Generally speaking, in this document, I use the phrase United States of America for clarity. Uh, there are a couple places where I use United States because, uh, for instance, on uh, page 2, line 18, whereas the United States Supreme Court has ruled in New York versus the United States, that was the body that ruled, as opposed to the Supreme Court of the United States. I do understand the, the distinction you are making. It is also important to realize that in the parlance of our founding fathers, the fundamental corporation is government. The corporation of New, ha of New Hampshire is uh, established in part two, article one. Uh, our found the corporations that are the United States Supreme, I'm sorry, the New Hampshire Supreme Court, uh, the New Hampshire General Court, uh, and all of their subsidiary corporations find their initiation in the 1780s. 
those corporations are founded for purposes of carrying out the business of the republic. So, in, 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 in essence, it is the state of New Hampshire, both its, corpor both its nature as a republic and its nature as a body politic, a corporation, that, are, that is a member of the Union of the United States of America. Uh, Representative, um, of course, uh, I had a couple of questions, but my question was asked earlier about I was concerned on how many states, and I couldn't remember that jumped on board last year. Uh, and I was, do we know of other states that are doing this uh, this year also on this? Uh, um, yeah, there are other states that are that are reinforcing. I'll let others answer that question. I have not had time to pay attention to those details. Um, but there are other states doing this, and I assume that, uh, I, I hope that just as before uh, this inspired other states, I hope that our passage of this will inspire other states as well. Well, I thank you. Once again, I mean, the last time I know being involved with this here at ATR 6 and sitting in the committee, and uh, asking the questions, it was a, to me it was an embarrassment on the floor that we had a fight about state rights to send this resolution out. And I, it killed me to even see that it was killed on the floor. You know, so hopefully this year we're going to have a um, people that will stand up for their constitution and tell the federal government enough is enough. Thank you. Okay, the chair will call uh, Representative uh, Lambert. The chief. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for a few moments of your time. It's the state's responsibility to defend its people against the absolute ruling of those people by its leaders. Some people believe that the Constitution is a historical document that reflects the values of the people who founded this nation, rather than a document that limits the authority of the federal government over the states that make up and compose this union. Our society was organized to protect the people against the absolute ruling of a federal government or any other tyrant. The Constitution took power, the powers to govern, and they delegated, and, our, and the states delegated certain powers to the federal government. But when the Constitution was written, the people who were there said, we need to protect our citizens. We introduced a Bill of Rights, not only to say these are the powers granted, but these are the powers retained. Our Constitution was designed to limit government. It was designed to bind the people under the power, the government under the power of the people. The people are both burdened and protected by this Constitution, but they don't know it. It is only us, the states, who can actually defend those people. And through re reaffirmation of this information, we can help our people and citizens understand that it is their government. Constitution matters. And if you don't believe me, look at the news. Because in Egypt, they suspended theirs the other day. If our government begins to fail us, it will be our responsibility to be redefine it. But at this point, the citizens in that country had to show up to do it. In our country, that power was delegated to the states. Our states need to say, you know what? You report to us. That was the intention. It was clear in the documentation. This is not a historical document. We need to say, this is our power. We need to make sure that you know it. We need to make sure that you remember that you really are given the power to consent to govern by the states. No government, no rule or authority has been granted any powers outside of the Constitution. Our founders in this state went out and said our people have natural rights. Any power not dictated in our Constitution, we didn't give up. When we ratified the federal Constitution, we didn't give up any of those powers. We didn't delegate them. We didn't have the right and authority. Let's make sure that we remind our citizens, not that we want to secede from the Union, but that we want to make sure the Union is responsible to them, their needs and desires, and prevent the over-expansion of government so that we make sure that in the future, we are not the potential victims of tyranny. Thank you, Representative. Do we have any questions for the Representative? Yes, Representative Burgess.
Okay. Thank you, Representative. Um, and, and I apologize for missing part of your presentation. I needed to make sure we hear you clearly. Um, uh, what if, what happens if the needs and desires of individual states differ? How is that resolved? Well, if the power wasn't actually given to the federal government, then each state is a sovereign uh, state and needs to operate on its own. There are places and cases where that's a real issue today, where people go out and say, these rights, which don't ex extend beyond our borders, are simply the control of ours. And, and to pick one that's sort of out in the press on a regular basis, we have multiple states that have gone out and passed uh, legislation for medical marijuana. The federal government says, you know what, you can't have that. The state of Colorado says we've licensed over 200 farms because we believe it's within our power and authority and jurisdiction to do that. And the federal government can get out. You can't go and defend your laws because within our state, we are the supreme authority. Thank you. Are there any other questions? What's that? It's well answered. Thank you. Representative. It's not true that prior to New Hampshire joining the union, there was no federal Bill of Rights. Because the requirement of New Hampshire, they have a Bill of Rights. And they had to have that before New Hampshire would join for the United States. Is that not true? I didn't know that. Uh, they didn't cover that in my New Hampshire history and constitution class when I was in high school. I didn't come from here. Um, I actually moved here, but I realized when I got here that this is a state government that actually respect, uh, respects and honors uh, the power and uh, authority of the people, and it wouldn't surprise me, and I would like to preserve that heritage of history. Is it not true that the feds only has jurisdiction It would, uh, there are some people who've made that argument. However, I believe that the Constitution also empowered some to um, allow, through amendment, the powers of taxation and some other things. Uh, so I, I'm not a, an absolute constitutional expert. Uh, so there are some subtleties that I didn't learn because I didn't go to law school. Uh, but I do believe they have some powers that extend beyond interstate commerce. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for your testimony. We send, when I say we, the state of New Hampshire sends four people to Washington, D.C., two senators and two members of the House of Representatives. Yes. If, and I'm confused, I, I really don't know the answer to this. If they vote for a particular law which allows the federal government to do something in the state of New Hampshire, by the fact that they voted for that law, do we concede anything? I do not believe so. The original way that our representative government was established, we sent two senators to represent the state legislature, and we sent two representatives to represent the people, because they both have distinct interests. The interests of the state legislator, legislature should be represented by the Senate, just like the, um, because the voice of the legislature is different, that should be the, um, the representation of our laws and mandates. Now, that was repealed because some people went out and said, you know, we really want to elect our senators. Here or there, I'm not going to argue whether or not that that particular constitutional amendment was a good idea because I don't have the power to repeal it yet. Given that, um, I think it's really important that we understand that the, gov the people we elect to go to Washington have no power that was not granted to them by the Constitution of the state of New Hampshire or by the Constitution of the United States. So I don't care what they say, there's absolutely no rationale for them to say that me buying an airline ticket on any given day allows me to surrender my constitutional rights to privacy and to security of my person, my papers, and my effects. Nothing has, I have never delegated that authority to anyone I've elected. And when they come to me with a constitutional amendment that allows me to make that change, I will make that decision. But no one, not me, not my ancestors, ever delegated that power. And I hope they never do. I hope that answers your question. 
I think I knew the answer all along, but I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Thank you, sir. At this time, since there's no other cards here, I'm going to close the hearing on the next I have a card in. Excuse me? I have a card in. I wish your card was the first person in this room to put my name on the list. Okay, I don't have a card. Well, I don't know where I'm at. All right, let me reopen this here, but I don't have one here. There's a card. Is that Gene Chandler? There we go. Do you have cards in front of them? Well, I don't know where it went, but I'm on the on the blue link there, and I did throw out a card. I was here. Okay, they happened to be the other day. Throw out the card, and then we'll go to the Senate. Okay, I'm going to have to get up here in a second because I'm sponsoring a, a co-sponsoring bill next door on the bridge for the Marine that got killed uh, the Marine. So uh, I might see about that. We can get in a few minutes and call me. Is this you? There's no name or nothing on this. That's not my card. I don't know what happened to my card. Like I said, I came to this room, was the first person on that list. All right, well, I apologize, but it's not here. I must have done this on these papers. Okay. Jim will call Pastor. The pronouncement or Patriot. The Patriot Pastor Garrett Lear. Okay, Patriot Pastor. I'm Sandborn Hill. Okay. Representative of Well of Living Water Christian Church and also the Heroes of American Liberty and a variety of other Patriot organizations. Uh, I want to say that I am American made in all American parts, and I'm not ashamed to say that which in America today is uh, problematic, unfortunately. And I want to say that Representative Itza, and this is sort of deja vu because in HCR 6 I also appeared in that hearing, and there aren't many times in our lives we get a second chance to do something the right way. And this is not a <coughs> radical thing at all, unless you consider the founding of America and the establishment of the Republic of New Hampshire radical. If you consider that, then what we're dealing with, I suppose, is radical. But this is actually the moderate position, and it is the position of our founding fathers. You know, I make my decisions in my life from a biblical worldview, and I can tell you that in 2 Samuel 23, it says that civil magistrates, that's you, must rule in the fear of God. Now, the reasoning behind that is not easily understood by many moderns because the issue of if an innocent person is ever convicted of something they have not done, that is a serious, egregious violation of God's law and man's law and common law. And so the whole understanding here, and I come to you this morning and I say, protect me, please protect me. Is there anybody in this country that does not believe that our national government has gone outside its boundaries and is trying to enforce things that should not be enforced? And I'm saying to you, as my elected representatives, civil magistrates ruling in the fear of God, protect me. And our founding fathers were wise enough to give us that protection. And a question was asked concerning the Bill of Rights. Three of the greatest patriots this country has ever produced, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Patrick Henry, would not go to the Constitutional Convention for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is they weren't sure how that was changing the Articles of Confederation, which incidentally had the state's rights issue in it, but also because they said there's no Bill of Rights here, which should be really... Uh, the chains to hold the government in place and protect the people. And they wanted that Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment deals with what is called the doctrine of interposition. Let me give you a short example of that. If we go out on the streets of Concord and there is a perpetrator, a criminal, who's about to harm a little old lady crossing the street or whatever else, as a patriot, as a Christian, as an American, 
as a person in New Hampshire, I am going to interpose myself between her, who cannot defend herself because the perpetrator is stronger and more ardent, I'm going to interpose myself and protect that little old lady and put myself between her and the perpetrator. This is what the doctrine of interposition on the Tenth Amendment is about. So that no innocent person would be convicted, no innocent person is put upon by somebody who has superior power to that. And I understand this point as well as anybody because I was six foot four and 197 pounds when I was 14 years old. And there weren't many men who could beat me wrestling or whatever else. So I understand the issue, the issue of using power. And remember that some people think that might makes right. But biblically, in the way our founding fathers understood it, it was right makes might. And so when we look, for example, above the state capitol building over there, what do we see? We see the seal of the republic of the state of New Hampshire. How many people know that? I don't know. It's important. <laughs> Good. And also, what about our seal? Five, five arrows to re represent the first five of our counties. We only have ten people across the country that call me about these things. How many counties you've got? A hundred? No, we've got ten. But we have the third largest legislative body in the world, only uh, second to the U.S. Congress and the British Parliament. And of course, they're joined together, and actually the Seal in the Latin means that unity makes strength stronger. Unity makes strength stronger. So this 10th Amendment, this HCR 19 bill, will make strength stronger for us. And incidentally, we, we all are kind of awakening to some of these things that have been asleep for a while. Across the country, I get calls from practically every state in the Union. They're dealing with these things, the same kind of questions that are being asked here. Well, is this a secessionist movement? And by the way, I had two ancestors that fought in the Union Army and were generals in the Union Army. I had a whole plethora of other people that fought in the Union Army. This is not about the war between the states. This can prevent the war between the states. This can prevent an overreaching national government and can provide protection as you are elected not to protect the United States, although you do take an oath to the Constitution of the United States, you're elected to protect me. And I'm holding you to that oath of office. And I believe this will help you. It will protect you also. Because you will be able to stand up and say, I'm not only American made of American parts, but I'm New Hampshire. And I represent New Hampshire. When I was in Senator Gregg's office a number of years ago, I asked for a drink of water. He said to me, okay, we uh, got one of the staffers to bring me a, a bottle of water. First thing I do, I'm not sure if I was wearing specs in those days, but I looked at the label and I said, Deer Park, Illinois, I don't drink this. He said, what's wrong? I drink Monadnock water. I'm from New Hampshire. <laughs> we have the best water in the United States. Why am I going to drink your senator from New Hampshire? and you've got Deer Park water, he looked at me like, well, what's that about? Well, how about supporting your own people? How about supporting your own economy? I think that's going to be important in the days to come. And so we have an opportunity to do the right thing now that we didn't do two years ago, and we should have done it then. And now we can, and this is a better write-up. I appreciate what Representative Itza is giving you the history behind it, but it's more than just history. This is not just saying, okay, everybody, you know, that's old time history, that's nice, but so what? This is for today. This will help us, and this will protect our state. It will keep us, perhaps, from going further into bankruptcy and a variety of other things that are being foisted on us for the benefit of who? And if you've listened to the testimony recently of, of Mr. Uh, the, the fellow who went to jail, Bernard Madoff, who's saying, well, the banks did what was good for them, even though it hurt me, and the federal government helped, and so forth and so on, and he ended up taking the fall. Well, I don't want you taking the fall for an overreaching federal government or a national government. I want you to protect me. And I'm sure there are other people who want you to protect them as well. Yes, I want to thank you for your testimony, but I, if there's nothing else that we can add, it's not the same that we've already heard. No. I have to move on. Be glad to have any questions. Have any questions? Yeah. Um, you uh, had a copy of the technical manual for legislators and judges. The two seals, 
Okay. Uh, the upper sea of the cape uh, needs to be protected from the lower sea. Do you agree? That's the doctrine of interposition. In fact, the whole issue, whether it was on Lexington Green with the Minutemen fight against the British, it was a defensive action. They simply said, we will stand our ground. We are legislated to do so as the Minutemen. We, as lesser civil magistrates, can stand against higher civil magistrates when the civil magistrates that are higher than we are overstepped their constitutional authority or their legislative authority or however you want to put that. That is the doctrine of interposition. Thank you. Seeing as no other questions, uh, I'm going to close your hearing on ACR 19. Uh, Representative Kimmel, can you look next door to see if Gene uh, okay. is already done so I can get into the next question? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to open up an executive session here on ACR 19. And um, is there any conversation? Uh, or I can pass the gavel and make a motion on the pass. I have a blurb on the second. Yeah, I want to get a blurb on the second. Uh, Representative Cunningham. I'd like to uh, make a motion that uh, we find this uh, bill ought to pass. I'll second. And we have a second by Representative Tamberone. Uh, any discussion? Representative uh, Tiberge, I know you're sitting there just waiting to jump on. I'm a little bit confused because, you know, you didn't write a big minority for a floor, right? <laughs> no, no, I, uh, and the reason why I was prepared for this here, I sat through this the last time and I was highly in support and I know the Republican Party was very uh, in support of this here. So I was prepared rather than to waste the public or anyone else's time when we all knew we were here before. Instead of reinventing the wheel, we were ready to move forward. No, no, and I respect that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, I'm not really being versed in this. And I think it's extremely enlightening, uh, you know, food for thought and whatnot. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't like voting in favor of something I'm not well versed on or comfortable with. So. Uh, I would. Uh, I want to hope that as American and uh, that you are and, uh, a highly dedicated, you know, uh, a veteran, and uh, that you would say, "Wow, state sovereignty! I'm on board with that. I know all about my rights." But uh, if uh, you know, my friends on the left are confused and need more study on American history, then I can relate to that. Uh, can, can I make a comment? Yes. It's just uh, I'd like to offer uh, training on your caucus by the Natural Rights Council. We put on training for all this. Any members of your <laughs> to come to it. Right, we're not going to yeah, we, we won't get into that, please. Yeah. Uh, what is that you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, I know I was over next door, but um, I did follow this bill when it was last term, and I had Dan's on my show. Uh, so I prepared to vote today. Okay. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I just want to comment. Our Supreme Court don't even understand that technical manual. Would you believe? I believe it. The, all our rights are in under the uh, part one. It says right under there, okay? Bill of Rights. In part two, it's a form of government. And our Supreme Court don't even understand what they're supposed to be, okay, which has messed up this state with their rulings and so on. Okay? There are no rights in part two. Part two is a form of government. It's how the corporate government will operate, puts forth the policies to do the work of the sovereign state. Do you agree? I agree. <coughs> Everyone else agrees? Okay. Uh, anything else to add? Yes, sir. No more? Uh, and I will go to the vote. <laughs> I would hope that my friends here uh, on the left here would be more than happy to out of in support of uh, state sovereignty and who uh, are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, the clerk will call uh, the vote. Okay, Vice Chairman Weisenbecker is not here. Uh, Representative Christensen? Yes. Representative Smith not here. Representative Cunningham? Yes. 